Hi guys, remember this? Yep, it's the Bocophone F1. And I have a feeling you do remember it because this is one of those smartphones that's actually pretty hard to forget. I mean, it's still popular despite having launched many months ago and when you think about it, that actually makes sense. It is, after all, a cheap smartphone with flagship specs. So why don't we dive into how that combo works out when you use it for an extended period of time. I'm Vlad for GSM Arena and this is our Bocophone F1 long-term review. The grand list of obvious downsides of the Pocophone is covered in this video right here, which you can also find linked in the description below. But now let's take a look at what makes this phone shine in day-to-day -day use, as well as a few new quirks that have popped up while it was the one and only smartphone in my pocket. I'm gonna start with the best thing about this phone, and that is performance, speed. Turns out, the race car analogy in the name was actually pretty spot on, because the Pocophone F1 is fast, it's smooth and practically lag free, so everything you'd want from a flagship in this day and age. It's also got amazing battery life, like among the best I've ever seen on any phone. Screen on times that are usually barely achievable on other devices within one day of use are really plausible to see on this one over two days without charging in between, and that might not be surprising given the battery capacity, but it's still incredibly refreshing to see on a day-to-day -day basis. And speaking of the battery, while it might be big in capacity, it doesn't negatively impact the phone's size. The Poco is still not too thick and very easy to use. The screen is very good, while not being the best ever, but still, it's nice to look at regardless of lighting conditions and it gets the job done without any huge issues. Well, that is, unless you live in a sunny place and like to wear polarized sunglasses a lot, in which case, when you hold the phone in portrait orientation, you won't see a thing. Anyway, this is an LCD, so the blacks will obviously not be as deep as on an OLED, but they're still pretty good and the colors nicely pop. The plastic build, despite possibly being a huge downside for some people, is actually not that bad, and you do get used to it pretty quick. And materials aside, the build quality of this phone is right up there with any other flagship. And hey, with the plastic, you might even stress less about dropping the phone, because there's one less sheet of glass that can break in the event of a fall. And if you get the armored edition with Kevlar on the back, which is what our review unit has, that's even more grippy than the vanilla plastic model, so you might even consider using this phone without a case. That's actually what I ended up doing because the case in the box is so thin and stretchy and flexible that I assume it's only good for preventing scratches and not much else. The fingerprint sensor on the back is very fast and incredibly accurate. I've only had like four or five misreads out of literally hundreds or thousands of unlocks while I had the Pocophone F1 as my only device. The Pocophone has already been updated to Android Pie, so Xiaomi kept the promise it made at launch. This is still something to be celebrated because even today, not a lot of Android devices run the latest version of the OS. Now, while MIUI might be controversial in itself, and I'll get to that in a minute, its gesture navigation system is frankly pretty amazing. And that's for a small but very important reason, the way the back gesture works. See, in order to go back, you don't have to reach the bottom of the screen and then initiate a swipe gesture from there. You simply swipe inwards from the left or right edges. Now this means that complicated finger gymnastics are actually not required at all in order to perform what is probably the most used action in the UI. And that is a definite boon for usability in my book. The camera is excellent for this price point, and sure, it doesn't match the best in the industry, but it does come pretty close, and for most people, most times, it will shoot pleasant pictures that are good enough, and the camera app itself is actually a joy to use. Next up, have you seen that price? I mean, sure, it's probably subsidized in some way to help get the new brand off the ground, and sure, future Boko phones might get progressively more expensive, because, hey, we've already seen that story with OnePlus, but for the moment, let's just enjoy how affordable this smartphone actually is. Oh, and a quick shout out to Jack. Headset Jack. Now let's talk about the not so good things. MIUI on the Pocophone tries to be more stock-like, but those efforts are just skin deep. Underneath, you'll still find the same trigger-happy app policeman that will randomly create issues for you with background processes or permission management. And this means that, unfortunately, sometimes things will go wrong, like parts of an app not working, or you're not seeing all notifications on the lock screen even though you chose that setting. And then you'll need to investigate. There are a lot of things that you might need to manually toggle in order to convince MIUI that your apps aren't actively trying to hurt you. And that's the price you need to pay for a skin developed primarily for China, where there is no Play Store, and the app stores that do exist are basically like the wild, wild west. 
The biggest issue I found with MIUI on the Poco phone is the fact that you only see notification icons in the status bar for a few seconds as each one comes in. Now, believe it or not, this is actually a new feature in Android Pie. It used to be even worse. You literally never saw any notification icons up there, ever. This might be fine if you're coming from iOS, but if you're switching from another Android device, then this could get frustrating real fast. And it all has to do with how wide the notch is to begin with, which brings me to the fact that it is that big in order to fit the IR sensor for face unlock, except the face unlocking still doesn't work in Europe, despite being promised to come soon after launch. And the notch is also apparently eating into some games and app content, but that's easily fixable through a software update. The lack of notification icons? Not so much, because of how little space there is to begin with in the display's ears or horns. The stereo speakers are a really nice gesture, especially at this price point, but even on the maximum volume setting they're not very loud. Also the earpiece channel is very, very low quality and much quieter than the standalone downwards facing speaker. The Pocophone F1 will not work very well in the US because it's missing a lot of necessary bands, especially when it comes to 4G. Now it's not officially available over there, but if you were thinking of importing one, please check your carrier's band support so that you're not in for a huge disappointment once the phone is in your hands. And finally, HD playback in Netflix and other services that use Widevine DRM still isn't fixed even though the Poco team has been working on this for a while. Well, that's been it for this long-term review. My impressions of the Pocophone F1 over the many weeks that I've used it as my only smartphone are generally very good. This is a proper flagship and one that's incredibly easy to recommend because of its price. That's also what makes a lot of its problems way easier to live with than if you'd encountered the exact same issues on a phone that costs, say, three times as much. Anyway, if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button below and subscribe to our channel for more content in the future. And if you really like what we do, why not hit that bell icon too? You'll be notified whenever we post something new. I'll see you guys next time.